We're going to talk about some stuff. I'm going to take a break again from, um, from apologetics. What I want to talk about tonight has to do with po apologetics, but we're going to, um, it's kind of the, um, you know, in the middle of a semester sometimes, when you're going, when you're talking about certain things, what will happen is you'll, you'll, you won't take a break necessarily from what you're studying, but you'll study kind of some ancillary pieces of what you're studying so that you can have a, a more robust knowledge. And then when you get back into the main topic of what you're studying, you'll have a little bit more understanding of what you're talking about or what you're being or what you're studying. So tonight, what I want to talk about is navigating the storms of our times. The um, base scripture that we're going to be coming out of is um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. I'm going to read. Um, well, let me, let me read this part because I wrote, I wrote a little introduction and I want to read it. As we gather today, we find ourselves amidst turbulent times. Yet in the midst of uncertainty, we find solace or peace and guidance in the eternal truths of God's word. Today, we're going to delve into, again, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, exploring its relevance to the challenges we face in our world today and finding assurance um, in the unchanging promises of Scripture. So I'm going to go ahead and read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. You guys can read along with me. Uh, but we know this. Hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. For, then, for among them are those who worm their way into households and deceive gullible women, overwhelmed by sins and led astray by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. They are men who are corrupt in mind and worthless in regard to the faith. But they will not make further prog progress, for their foolishness will be clear to all, as was the foolishness of Jonas and Jambres. But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra what persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, the Lord, in fact, to be persecuted, excuse me, I'm sorry, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But for you, continuing what you have learned and firmly believed, you know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for, again, allowing us to know and understand and believe that you said it in your word, that we believe it and that settles it. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, you allow me to decrease, Lord God, that you would increase, Lord, in me. Father, allow me to sit in the spirit in the, amongst the congregation, Lord God, to be taught this word that you've already given me, Lord God. I know there are precepts and revelations in this word that I have yet to receive, Lord God. I pray tonight that you teach those to all of us, Lord God, that we may receive this word this word that, and allow it again to permeate our hearts and our minds to be etched on our hearts in a way, Father, that allows it to become part of who we are, Lord God. That when we open our mouth and we share who you are, this word just comes forth from our mouths. Father, we pray that you allow this word to not only touch us, but touch 
those that we're going to be speaking this word to, Lord God. Give us the opportunity, Lord God. Put us in those divine intersections, Lord God, with um, faith and patience, Lord God, to be able to speak to situations in other people's lives, Lord God, that their lives can be changed also by this revelational word. So we just thank you tonight for being so amazing, so wonderful and awesome. It's in the name of your son, Yahshua HaMashiach, we pray. And everyone said amen. Amen. So tonight we're going to discuss, again, recognizing the signs of the time. So there's four points I want to discuss tonight. Number one, moral decay and spiritual apathy. Number two, their desire is to follow the will of society. Number three is the erosion of truth and rise of deception. Number four is the increase in persecution and hostility. Now, we may not get through all of these tonight um, because some of these are some really weighty and heavy topics, especially, you know, you guys hear me all the time talking about how there's a, such an increase in demonic activity um, and, I mean, we're seeing, like, it manifest itself. I mean, you're seeing manifestations of, of demonic things in people. You're seeing it happen. And, and now it's where it used to be kind of a thing where people would keep stuff hidden. Now people are not hiding the fact that they worship Satan. They're witches or warlocks. You know, they're part of a coven. Y'all know what a coven is? You know, a coven is, a, you know, a, a group of witches or warlocks. So they're, they're, it's like, okay, this is what we do. So because of that increased activity, again, as I said, you know, and when I talk to uh, other pastors and stuff like that, um, and I tell them that the window of salvation is closing, um, and then I share with them about different pieces and an understanding of how I'm seeing the window of salvation closing, they start nodding their heads in agreement. But the one thing that, um, and this is what birthed the whole do you know thing, is, and I asked them, are you teaching salvation? Are you teaching salvation in your church? Well, most people, you know, they think it's a basic message. It's something that, hey, everybody knows about salvation. But again, do you know what you would say if you stood before a holy God and he asked you, why should I let you in my heaven? Make sure your heart statement is right, because again, he ain't listening to your lips. So we want to make sure that we understanding the signs of the times because now it's time where the deceiver, we're going to start being deceived. You know, you got things that are happening over in, if any of you are eschatology people and you understand or study the end times, one of the things that's a linchpin in the last times is the red heifer. Now over in, now over in uh, um, Israel, they're preparing to slaughter the red heifer. But again, I think that's going to, they can't, it can't be the right red heifer because the right people ain't doing it. But the one thing about it is we, the Bible also talks about how there's going to be, you know, um, the holy places are going to be desecrated, you know, in the end times. So we just got to be mindful of a lot of that stuff. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, but you need to be aware. It says, but you need to be aware that in the final days, the culture of society will become extremely fierce and difficult for the people of God. People will be self-centered, lovers of themselves, and obsessed with money. Now, the Apostle Paul warns Timothy of a time when people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, without self-control. Today, we witness similar moral decay and spiritual apathy where self-indulgence and materialism reign supreme. We see these things on TV all the time where we see that, you know, it's all about getting the bag. You know, on social media, they got all these things where you can you make this money real quick. And, you know, and, and, I, and I love that Pastor is really transparent about all the stuff that he's been involved in to, to, to make money quick. And I've, I've, I've gone that same way, too. You know, the pyramid schemes, the noni juices and the coffees and all that other stuff. I've been a part of all that stuff, too. But the thing is, the Bible teaches principles about how you get wealth. And when you get wealth quickly, it leaves quickly. You know, when you start, when you do work and you build, things happen and you can able to sustain that wealth because you start, you start learning principles about money as you're building wealth. It's almost like you get in the lottery. 
I mean, I ain't gonna lie to you. Me and my wife, we, we talk about that billion dollars that they had, they, you know, and what we would do, you know, if, if we won it. But the thing about it is, more often than not, money like that ends up in the hands of people that don't know what to do with it. Those are the same people that, you know, like the guy that won the billion dollars last year that bought all the houses out in California and stuff. You know what I'm saying? He's getting sued out of all his money right now. You know, because again, it's you getting all that money, but you don't have the, the ability to manage that. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine today when we were talking about these, cat, these kids that are in college getting all this NIL money. They don't know how to manage this money. You know, they're just getting million dollar paychecks and they're going out and buying. You don't, do you need a Lamborghini in college? You know, I can show y'all a picture. When I first moved to Dallas, when I first moved to Dallas, for three months, I drove a, uh, I rented a Lamborghini. Don't ask me why, and don't judge me. Don't judge me. I would never do it again. I would never want to own a car like that. And most people, it's not practical. Now, when you're in college, you ain't about practicality. You're about shining, right? But the thing about it is, is that, you're doing things now that are going to affect you later on in a negative way because you're spending all that money. I spent four thousand dollars to 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 lease a Lamborghini, and I could what I could have done with four thousand dollars in the rule of seventy two. Now, come on, that was sixteen years ago, and the rule of seventy two and four thousand dollars. Do the math real quick. Um, I'll get back to you, Nick. Do the math real quick. But rule of seventy two, that money. Doubles and triples a couple of times, man. I'm sorry, I'm sitting on fifty, sixty thousand dollars by now. But no, I spent four thousand dollars to lease a Lamborghini. But that's where our, our society is right now. Our society is in a place where money is a is the thing that everybody wants. And again, money itself is not evil. It's the love of money that we have in this society now, where people are just so overwhelmed and so consumed with getting money. And, and what happens now is, um, does anybody know what the first rule of nature is? When I say it, y'all going to say, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Huh? First rule of nature is self-preservation. That's the first rule of nature. But what's the first rule? What, is the, what are the two commandments? What God, Jesus said, he said, the whole of the law and the prophets Rest on these two things. I said what? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, and all thy spirit, and love thy neighbor what? as thyself. So again, what the world is talking about is so counterintuitive to what the word teaches. But that's what the world wants you to believe. Hey, think about yourself. It's all about you. You know, um, you know, you get on these things and they talk about who's the prize. Is the woman the prize? Is the man the prize? We are not going to get into that conversation in here. But, you know, it's, it, but it's, it's so self-centered because Jesus taught us to do what? Esteem others higher than yourself. So for me, that means that I got to think about my wife before I think about me. And my wife thinks about me before she thinks about herself. But what does that mean if you're, you know, Mr. Paul, what does that mean if I'm not married? But that means that even in, when you're out in the world, you still got to think about other people before you think about yourself. But think about other, somebody else's well-being. You know, whether you at Starbucks and paying it forward, you know, or whatever it is. But think about somebody else. Don't always, because what happens is when the word of God says what? It says, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. But before that, he says what? He said, Lord, when have I, you know, when were you naked and I did not, when were you and I did not, he said, you know, he said, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. So when you're doing it for other people, you're lending to the Lord. But the world doesn't want you to believe that. The world wants you to believe, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the rest. That's what the world wants you to believe, because right now they want you, because everybody's motive in everybody, what everybody thinks about is getting the bag now. And, and now we live in this day where everybody, the word of God said what goes before destruction? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall, right? So, but we live in a society now where everybody 
wants you to be super self-confident. And there's nothing wrong with self-confidence. We want you to be, God wants you to be confident in this word, in the kingdom, in your salvation, but in yourself. That's treading a line that, you know, not many of us can navigate maturely because we get built up and puffed up. You know, we start, you know, as, as one of my coaches said when I was in high school, he said, Polly, don't believe everything you read about yourself because you're going you're gonna to read some good stuff about yourself that you the whole nine yards and you're going to read some bad stuff about yourself. And it's basically don't get in, you know, he said, like Paul said, he said, he says, I don't, whether I'm about, abound or abased, he said, I'm going to be content wherever I'm at. And that's where God wants you to be content. Don't, don't get too high on yourself. Don't, don't, don't think about um, how you're just so, the word of God says in Proverbs, it said, let another praise you, not your own lips. And I'm going to stop right there because what happens is some, sometimes when you, when you get to the point where you have to start talking about how great and how awesome you are, you're, you're really trying to build yourself up. And there's really some kind of situation going on in yourself with your self-confidence. And, and it's okay because I know I, I, I dealt with that, dealt with it in high school, dealt with it in college. And guess what? I still deal with it. You know, but the thing about it is just not getting so overwhelmingly um, boastful about yourself and proud about your, and having pride about yourself because anytime you have pride and the world wants you to think that pride is a good thing but the Bible teaches us that pride is one of the what? It's one of the seven deadly sins. Lust, greed, hate, envy, pride, sloth and wrath. But he says what? He wants us to have the fruit of the Spirit which is lo what? Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and the last one, which I always want to talk about, because I believe that it activates all the other ones, self-control. You know, I was just reading in Proverbs, I think it was, today is the 18th. I want to say it was the 16th. It said, how can you take a city when you can't even control your temper? You talk about doing all this great stuff, but you can't even control yourself. You know, stuff like that talks to me because I have to make sure I'm keeping myself in check because there's a lot of great things I want to do. But how is God going to take you into these great rooms and do all this great stuff when you can't manage yourself? You have to be able to manage yourself. Hold on a second. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay. And, and one of the other things that um, is coming out of this society where moral decay and spiritual apathy, I know you guys, and we've talked about it before, how a lot of, you'll see on social media, a lot of the street preachers and people that, because it's like more, I'm, I remember there was a day where every now and then you would see people on the street, you know, repent, you know, you know, Jesus is coming and all that kind of stuff. But now you see that a lot. You see a lot of people on the streets preaching. You know what I'm saying? I know when, when I was in uh, Los Angeles last week, when I was going to pick up Tara, I saw two different people preaching about Jesus coming. And what happens is if you get on social media and watch this stuff, people are getting into, into these guys' face. I mean, some of them are getting physically accosted or physically abused. You know, they're getting in people's face, they're spitting in people's face for just talking about the gospel. And it's just like it says in the scriptures, you're going to go through persecutions. You know, being as, if you're sincere about being, you know, a person of God, you're going to suffer where people that probably was with you before, they're not going to be with you now because now you, because you're professing the faith. But who you want to go with? You're going to go with, because again, the narrow way. Are you going to go the narrow way? You're going to go the way that everybody else is going. Because the thing about it is, is at the end of the day, 
There's going to be, uh, and we'll talk about it in another Bible study, because I really want to study this out, because this is a, a scripture that comes up so much in conversation, where it says, in that day, there will be many, there will be many that will say, Lord, did not heal, did not perform miracles in your name, you know, did not do all of this other stuff in your name, and he will say, depart from me you workers of iniquity, and check out this part. He said, I never knew you. Knew is what? Past tense. So even when you were invoking the name of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, whoever, whoever Jesus is to you and whatever name you call, even though you were invoking the name, because remember, the power, just like the song says, the power is in the name. But you, so now you were invoking the name and doing all these wonderful things. So why is, why is Jesus, you standing before him, God's right next to him, and he's saying to you, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Because again, it's not going to be what comes out of your lips that they're going to be listening to. It's co what comes out of your heart. So you could be doing all these things. And see, the whole thing about that scripture, and I was telling this to some leaders that leaders have to check up more than anybody else because I really believe that scripture was talking to leaders because leaders are mostly the ones that are what? Doing the healing, doing all these wonderful works. But when you're doing these things for your glory and not for the glory of God, that's when he's going to say to you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, us lay people, and I'm including myself in lay people because, you know, I did not ask to be up here. So... We have to be mindful, too, because we all have a, everybody in this room has a ministry in them. Everyone in this room is a leader. So there's going to be people that are going to come to you and ask you questions about. And that's why we're doing apologetics. People are going to come to you and ask you about things regarding salvation, things regarding God, things regarding Jesus, things regarding the Bible. And you're going to be the person that's going to give them those things. But are you going to walk away when they say to you, when they say to you, because you are so um, you were so adept and you were so convincing and you were so sincere and enthusiastic about sharing these things. When they say to you, well, I want to develop a relationship. I want to have the same kind of relationship you have with God. And when you lead them to Christ, when you walk away, when you lead them to Christ, are you going to be like, yeah, I did it? Or are you going to say, glory to God? What are you going to do? Are you going to glorify God who gave you everything that you need to lead that soul? Because the, the word of God says what? The angels do what? They rejoice over one being saved. So are you going to give yourself the glory or are you going to rob God of his and say, God, I did it. I did it. We got to be we got to check up on that stuff. It's small things. It's a little bit. And, and the word of God says what? It's the small foxes that spoil the vine. See, we think it's sometimes it's going to be big, huge stuff that's going to keep us from entering in. It's not going to be huge stuff. It's going to be the little stuff that sometimes you don't even think about it. God has said, God said, I'm a jealous God. God said he won't his. Are you going to give it to him? That's the, that's the point. So Jesus himself warned of a lot of things. One of the things he, he warned about the love of money as a root as the root, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil in. And in Matthew 6, 24, I don't know how, if uh, Tim has it up. He says, no one can serve two masters. I love this scripture. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, other or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This one is a hard one because we go through stuff every day where we need that bread. We work for that bread. We need that bread. But we can't come a slave to the bread. You know, dollar, you know, what old girls say, and um, I can't think of the name of the movie. Tinker, what's the name of that movie? Uh, you make the money. Don't let the money make you. Players Club. I was about to say, don't act like y'all say all the way. Like, 
you know, like y'all ain't never watched no. But but that but it's a, such a truism. Because we come become such a slave to making money. Because we know what money can do for us. But at the end of the day, the money is no different than a screwdriver or a hammer. It's just his job is different. And you have to look at it that way. Because if, if you're not careful, what will happen is God is paying attention to everything we're doing. Everything we're doing. And he's a jealous God. So when you make God, when you make money a God, guess what he's going to do? If you have any kind of relationship with him, he's going to stop. He's going to stop that thing from flowing. That's why for me, I had to check up when, when, when I lost my job, when I got laid off, when I got fired, when I couldn't find a job. I went through all of those, every last one of them. Like I said, I told y'all the story about unemployment checks and all that kind of stuff. I had to check up and say, God, am I, am I making too much of this? You know? But we have to be mindful of how we're the, the what, is our, what is our paradigm or how do we look at our, our point of view when it comes to money? Do we, do we overemphasize us being able to get money or do, we, or do we look at it, can we put it in its proper context and say, it's a tool, let me get it so I can first of all do what? So I can first of all sow into the kingdom. And then God, God's word said, he's a, he said he's going to bless the other percent. He said he's going to bless the 90 and, you know, we, again, we've had this wonderful teaching over the last few months about how tithing is not Old Testament, how tithing precedes the, the Levitical books of the Bible, how tithing is in Genesis because it said that what? Abel did what? He brought his what to God? First fruits. And God accepted his first fruits. So, so we got to be mindful, and again, just as I was saying earlier, putting these principles into place so that we can, we can be prosperous. Uh, you're going to love one and hate the other. This is where a lot of people get messed up when it comes to tithing, because they love money so much they can't see, you know, because the more money you make, that 10% grows as your money grows. See, now when you're making $100, that $10 ain't, it ain't you. But when that thing got a comma on it and a couple zeros on it, you're like, Lord, that's a big check Tara got to write. That's a big check. But the, the word of God says, God loves a cheerful giver whose gift is in his giving. So, so the thing about it is, is that you got to be grateful and say, God, thank you for these commas and these zeros in my account. But, but moreover, God, whew, I know where my blessings come from, so here you go. This is what I owe you. Not I'm not giving you nothing. What I, if I'm giving something, I'm giving Chris $10 because, you know, he needs some gas money. Oh, you need some gas money? You good? Okay, all right. But, but... If I'm giving somebody something, I'm giving somebody something because my heart said I want to give it to him. But that's not what it is with God. We owe that to God. And when you don't give it to him, Malachi told you what you're doing. Will a man rob God? You do. You rob me with your what? Your tithes and your offerings. So if you're not giving, and I'm not trying to make this a tithe message, but don't have enmity with God where you where you feel some kind of way about God because when you get your check, when you get your net, and we'll, we can, I, I'm, I'm still having a conversation with Pastor about net and gross, but wherever you fall on that spectrum, when you get your check and you're saying, okay, God, because I didn't, I didn't have this happen. Say I got a check for $2,000 and I'm supposed to tie 200 out that 2000 I said, God, you know, I'm going to holler at you later on, you know what I'm saying? You know, we're we going to holler back. You know what happens? My TV will go out. Or my car will break down. And guess how much it costs to fix it? $200. That same tithe that I was supposed to give God, 
is the same amount that it cost me to get whatever I need, whatever happened to get it right. And I'm saying, I'm sitting here looking at God like, you be tripping. But I'm the one that's tripping. Because I, I guarantee you if I were to tie, my TV wouldn't have went out or my car wouldn't have went out. And, and I mean, we just got to learn these things and just understand that y'all think, well, now I'm going to say y'all. We think, because I'm, I'm putting myself in that because I done been there. We think God don't be paying attention to us. Oh, God ain't paying attention to me, little old me. Guess what? What did I tell y'all before? I told y'all before y'all are a miracle. Y'all are a miracle. Out of all the seeds that were swimming to get to the egg, God tapped on you, 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 you. Even you back there, Ebony, he tapped on you too. Believe it or not, he tapped on you. Miss Dawn, Mr. Franklin, Nick, Chris, Tara, he tapped on every last one of them and said, I want you to come into existence. I got a, I got a plan for you. So, you. so y'all not just here by happenstance. Y'all not just here because, you know what I'm saying, somebody had a good night. Somebody had a good night. You're not just here because of that. You're here because God knew what he was doing when he brought you into existence. So if he brought you into existence with a purpose, you think he ain't paying attention? Let y'all, let y'all, hold on, hold on, check this out. Let y'all, let somebody borrow some money, right? And they owe y'all some money. And they still owe y'all some money. And y'all see them come up in with some new J's on. Ain't y'all paying attention? Hey, that joker owe me some money coming here with some new J's on. You think God ain't paying attention the same way? Paying attention the same way. You're supposed to give me my tithe. Here you come up here. You got a new, new purse. You don't went, don't went to on a vacation with my money. Ain't that what y'all be saying though? Y'all be saying the same thing. Joker done went and bought some J's with my money. Knowing they owe me money. God is saying the same thing. When you don't tithe, God is saying the same thing. He paying attention. And see, the only difference between us and them is see, all we can do is go key your car. All we can do is go put sugar in your tank. I'm not advising y'all to go do none of that. But I'm just saying we can only do little things. God, he can hold stuff up. He can turn TVs off. He can break cars. He can do whatever he want to do to get your attention. All we, because all we can do is sit there and be like, when they come and speak to you, when they got them J's on, all you can be like, really? This is what we doing? You know you owe me, right? Well, I'm going to pay. God don't do that. God is going to hold up something. So if there's something going on in your life, I'll be checking up with this too, man. When it get tight, okay, God. What do I need to release? That's the question. What do I need to release for God to let go of what's going on in my life if I'm struggling? Because it don't start, it don't start nowhere with, but with us. Because more often than not, when we got, when things get tight, when there's an issue with certain things that are going on, we need to first look at ourselves and say, God, what am I holding on to? that I need to release. And I'm just sharing this stuff with y'all because again, these are just, these scriptures are illuminating stuff that happens in my life. And like I said, to now, now it's, it's almost like my life in a lot of ways is on like cruise control. Cause stuff happens to me, so the same stuff happens, man. You know, like, you know, Jobs are downsized and all that kind of stuff. The only thing that happens to me when I get downsized out of a job, when somebody says, hey, Paulie, we're not going to contract. We're going to hold ahead and stop this project and the project's over. What happens is invariably, invariably, when I'm here and something happens, for me, a setback is only a setup for a comeback. And I always, God always takes me to a higher level. Because I'm not beholden to none of this stuff, man. I don't try to hold on to my money and hoard my money. Man, I, I'm going to tell you, I praise God that he gave me the wife. I guess she's just a bigger giver, giver than I am. I'm the person, if I catch you in a restaurant sideways, 
Don't trip if the, the waiter comes up and says, oh, your bill's already paid for. All you need to pay for is a tip. Because that's what we do. We love doing that. And we don't want no credit for it. We don't want, we tell the waiter, don't let them know who did it. You got to be able to release it. Because when you release stuff, guess what it, guess what it, the position in your hands is? Now God ha you have open hands and God can give you more. Big trash can. I'm about to wrap up. Big trash can. Water hose. The water is money. Which one you want to be? The water hose or the big trash can? Anybody raise a hand? No bad answers. No wrong answers. Which one you want to be? Nick, which one you want to be? You want to be the... 50 gallon trash can. Every gallon is a million dollars. Which one you want to be the hose or the trash can? Huh? Huh? I can't hear you. A base. Okay, okay. But I'm asking you which one you want to be. You want to be the 50-gallon trash can, or you want to be the hose? I'm going somewhere with it. What you want to be? Why you want to be the hose? Hose, stay wet. Because you leave that trash can there long enough, guess what will happen? When that sun come out, guess what's going to happen? That water starts evaporating. But that hose, you can crinkle that hose up. And let that hose go, it's going, the water going to keep flowing. See, I want to be the one that keep, that's flowing because as long as I can give every last one, if I can give every last one of y'all some water, God going to keep my faucet flowing. But if I got a pail, I'm just getting that for myself. That's all I'm getting it for. Y'all feel what I'm saying? I'm trying to give y'all a little bit tonight, man, so y'all can just get a perspective on the fact that God is paying attention to every little thing we do. And because of what's going on around us, God is shining a light, an even brighter light on us and paying attention to us because we call ourselves believers. Because you got to decide what you're going to be. Are you going to be one of these what I call cultural Christians? One of these cultural Christians that say, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. But your lifestyle says something different because they got this stuff out there. They got whole churches where they got people that are pastors that um, have a whole nother lifestyle. They have a Queen James Bible now. Yes. They, had a, they have a Queen James Bible now. No, that's not amazing, bro. That's, that's not amazing. I know it. I know it. That's especially coming from you. I love it. But yeah, they got a whole, they got a whole Queen James Bible. And when you talk to them, and see, this is the reason that we talk about apologetics, because we want to be mindful, because, again, no matter what somebody's sexual orientation is, guess what? At the end of the day, God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. Because we're not going to win anybody to Christ telling them you're wrong, shaking fingers, pointing fingers, and telling them that you're wrong. We can't do that. We got to tell them God loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. But we got to be... We got to understand that God loves us and wants to have a relationship with us first. And not, not, and not just a casual relationship. Not one that we see him, we talk to him every now and then. Hey, how you doing? No, he wants a deep, abiding relationship, a cultivated relationship. A cultivated relationship is one where you have what? Intimacy. Into me, you see. And if you don't have an intimate relationship with God, that's part of the issue right now. That's part of the issue where you, you're having these issues in life. You're, now, you're going to go through trials and tribulations, just like he said in the word. You're going to go through a lot of stuff being a Christian. But there's certain things that you shouldn't have to worry about. Like the, the, the scripture says what? Um, you see the birds of the air? You see the lilies of the field? You see the, you know, um, all these things. 
God takes care of them. He makes sure they have a roof over their head. That he makes sure they're clothed and all that kind of stuff. But here we are. We struggle with these things. We struggle with a place to stay. We struggle with a job. We struggle with all these things. And God says in his word that we don't have to struggle with those things. Our struggles are going to be that people are going to be coming against us because of what we believe. Our struggle is going to be that we're going to be trying to kind of get this gospel out and, and the enemy is going to be coming against us to kind of prohibit us from getting the gospel and changing people's lives. So I'm just saying to y'all tonight, man, if you're going through issues and situations and circumstances in your life right now, first of all, check in with God. And when you check in with God, say, God, where am I slipping at? Where do I, where do I need to check up at? Where do I need to tighten up at? Because all of it is, is, is comes from here. Because we can talk about all the external stuff that we want to talk about. Yes, the external stuff has, there's effect and effect. Y'all know there's a difference, right? You know what I'm saying? Certain things are affected by, but certain things cause an effect. And what happens within us is the lack of a, a deep relationship with God, a real and authentic relationship with God, affects us in a way, in a negative way. Because we're not really plugged into the source. It's almost like, you have you ever been vacuuming the floor? You got the vacuum plugged in, and you get too far, and the plug comes halfway out, and the vacuum starts, you know, <laughs> you know, and it's, I mean, I'm like that because I love to run the sweeper. I'm sorry. I love to run the sweeper. And that's what we call it in Alabama. We don't call it vacuum cleaner. We call it a sweeper. So, but when you when the plug comes halfway out, that means it's not getting you're not getting a good connection. Or 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 another thing is when a light bulb is not all the way in, and it blinks on and off. That might be your situation. That there's not a lot of light in your life, or you're not able to get up all the the crap and the crud in your life because you don't have a good connection. So tonight, I want to do something a little different. Because tonight, I want us to, the Word of God says, for us to confess our sins one to another. And so, and it says, confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. So in your confession, there's healing in your confession. So tonight, what, what I want us to do is, I'm not going to put nobody on blast about, um, sharing sharing our sins with each other. We're just going to come and we're going to pray for everybody. And I'm going to pray over everybody because we need to be in a place where we have a deep understanding and relationship with Yahweh through his son, Yeshua HaMashiach. Because there's going to be, like I said, there's leaders in this room. And whether we're on the golf course or we're at work, whether we're, you know, in a store, wherever we are, God is going to create divine intersections for you where you're going to be able to share the love of God with somebody, and you need to be ready for that. Because, again, the Word says that, you know, some things that you're going to be able to deal with that can only happen through prayer and fasting. And I was talking with somebody this week. If you don't have a fasting life, if you pray, I'm sure everybody in here prays, does everybody in here have a fasting life? Develop a fasting life. Because the word says it. It says what? Some things only happen by prayer and fasting. So that's, those are two crucial component, components of your relationship with the Most High. So I'm going to challenge you guys. You know, I, I say that it's 30 days in a month. Give them three days of fasting from sunup to sundown. Three days. That's all. But I'm going to ask you guys to come up here to the front tonight. And we're going to pray and get up out of here. Sis, you ain't got to go nowhere with them ankles over there. You just stay there with them ankles. We, gonna, we, we know you up here in the spirit. In the name of Jesus. I want y'all to link up or hold hands. All that's good. from you. Hold my wife's hand. Can I hold my wife's hand? Praise Thank you. And we're just, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to, I'm going to just call out some sins and call out 
things and and you can just under your breath just just confess your own sin to the most high but I want I want air to come out your mouth as you confessing it because I want God to hear it and I don't want it just to be one of those things where you keep it bottled up in your spirit praise the Lord I'm on time Lord don't do that don't do that don't do that don't do that in the name of Jesus um I want you guys to, to, I want God to hear it. And I want him to just hear it from your spirit. I want him to hear it from your lips. It says confession comes from your mouth. So confess your sins tonight. Like I said, I don't need to hear it. It just needs to be you and God. It can be a whisper. Because he hears the whisper. So I want you to confess that thing tonight. We're going to lay that thing at the altar. We're going to ask God to remove the desire, the taste, the appetite for it so that we can move forward in God and, and, and do the do works of the kingdom and not just do works that all we do is pleasing ourselves. So let's go before the throne. Most gracious and all wise Yahweh. Father, first of all, we come. Um, your word says, submit to you and resist the devil, Lord God. We come to you submitted tonight. Father, we, you said in your word for us to confess our sins to each other, Lord God. Father, we stand in assembly right now confessing, Lord God, that we, we have the sexual sins, Lord God. We have sins of pride. We have, Father, uh, sins of, of theft and stealing, Lord God. We have sins of lying, Lord God. We have all these sins, Lord God. And Father, you know all the sins that stand before you tonight, Lord God. We ask right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you remove the appetite, remove the desire, remove the taste, remove anything that's in us that desires to continue in that way or in those sins, Lord God. Father, we put it before the throne right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We ask that you, again, just purge those desires from us, Lord God, that we can be uh, empty and clean vessels, Lord God, vessels ready to be inhabited by the spirit, the, your spirit, Lord God, by that Ruach, Father, by, by that paraclete, Father, that helper, the Holy Spirit, Lord God, that will lead us into all truth, Lord God, to lead us in a place of humility, because your word says, if we humble ourselves before you, that you will lift us up in due time. So, Father God, we just thank you tonight, Father, for us coming together, Father, touching one another, Lord God, encouraging one another, Lord God, in our prayers, Lord God. Because we come to you, Father, not as perfect beings, Lord God, but as imperfect. Because we come to you, Father, knowing that Jesus Christ died for every sin we're confessing tonight, Lord God. So, Father God, we lean on the cross tonight, Lord God. We lean on the cross of Calvary, Lord God. We lean on what Jesus already done for us, Lord God. And we put that belief in our hearts, Lord God. We believe it with every fiber of our being, Lord God. And if every fiber our, in our being is not in agreement, Lord, we pray that you put it in agreement, Lord God, but that we know we serve a living Christ, Lord God. A God that you put up on the cross to die for our sins, Lord God, that you put in a tomb for three days, Lord God, and you allowed him to rise with all power, Lord God. And right now he sits at, the, at your right hand, Lord God, interceding for us, Lord God, being that mediator between us and the law, Lord God. So Father God, with those sins that would kill us, that put would make us dead, Lord God, we only live because we ask for grace and mercy through your son, Yeshua HaMashiach. So, Father God, we pray that you allow us to go before, uh, away from this altar, Lord God, being renewed and refreshed, Lord God, being reinvigorated again with your spirit, Lord God, to do the works of the kingdom, Lord God, to be about kingdom business, Lord God, to do the things that you've called us to do in the earth, Lord God, Father, that allow us to know and receive you and your spirit, Lord God, that we can stand before your holy, your holy your holiness of holies, Lord God. And when you ask us that question, Lord God, what, was, must, what must we do to be saved, Lord God? And moreover, Father, what have we done that allows us to come into heaven, Lord God? And we can say to you, we shouldn't be here, Lord God. We don't deserve to stand before a holy God, but only because of the cross of Christ are we able to enter into heaven because your word says so. So, Father God, we just thank you tonight. We praise you. We lift you up, glorify, and magnify your holy and righteous name. It is in the name of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. And everyone said amen. Amen.